So let's start off with current events and then we'll move along with your history and things on your mind. Okay, so what have you been up to in the last month? Wow. Uh, fall started coming, the uh, leaves, I wanted to get the gutters off my house right. uh, before it snowed. I didn't get that done. Uh, I didn't want to get up and hurt myself uh, taking those down on wet, slippery uh, cedar wood that I would have had to stand on the pergola and do. Uh, we realized we needed a new furnace, needed a new chimney sweep, came right. in and did that. So we basically got in the house winterized to the tune of about ten thousand dollars worth of work <laughs> which uh, I have to dig a new uh, leach field for my uh, for my septic tank but uh, it's not glamorous it's not glamorous but it's uh, it's good good honest work that's true <laughs> and I'm gonna do that and uh, you've got to do it uh, in the middle of the night so the neighbors don't see it because somehow with the new environmental laws and stuff you know, they don't realize that they, they, they're afraid that my septic will leach down into the Black River. Right. Which is over three quarters of a mile at a rate of about an inch every hundred years. <laughs> they might get Al Gore after you. Might get Al Gore after me, but... Uh, He'll beat you with his Nobel yeah, Prize. Yeah, the, the 800 cows that are <laughs> pooping in the Black River just upstream, that has nothing to do with uh, the affluence or the... Uh, <laughs> or the bloom of algae in the river and the reason why the uh, the trout <laughs> seem to have, uh, what do you call it? Uh, teeth? Penines? Yeah, the little, <laughs> little things and uh, spinach in between their right. teeth. But uh, yeah, I'm doing a lot of work at the house trying to get it done and then... Uh, did you follow the Red Sox in October? We did. Uh, and what are your feelings on them winning? The most amazing thing about that was I felt sorry for Manny Ramirez, who didn't get to play the last month of the season because right. he strained an oblique muscle. And everybody in Boston called him a malingerer, they called him a deadbeat, they called him everything because they were afraid that the Yankees were going to catch him and everything. And I said, would you like a healthy Manny at the end of the season or do you want a two-thirds Manny at the end of the season? And he rested, and it cost him because he didn't get to drive in 100 runs. He right. didn't get to hit 300 for, I guess, the 13th straight season, which would have tied him with Roger Hornsby as the greatest right-handed hitter of all time. But does he really care? He doesn't. He doesn't. <laughs> which is amazing because, you know, he's just the nice savant who goes out and can hit his good as anybody I've ever seen and he was well rested right and then we lose to Cleveland and we're about ready to go onto the skids and go to the golf course with all the other uh, also rands in the American League and right. he comes out with a statement that it really doesn't matter in the scheme of things and everybody again you know uh, chastises him in the, in the city of Boston you know basically because it's a Puritan work ethic there right. and they don't adhere to that manana-ism that, uh, that Manny has. And Manny goes out and hits two tremendous home runs and shots that wins the two ball games along with him and Ortiz, which brings it back to 3-3. Then they end up beating Cleveland. He had an off-the-wall single. Yeah, he well, What's it about that? He hit a home run? Is yeah. that even out of the park? Yeah, and the funny thing is that ball went over the outfielder's glove and landed on the plywood and landed right on the where the plywood meets to the fence and right. bounced back into the park. If it had gone another inch, it would have bounced into the stands. I believe it was a home run. But still, shouldn't you hustle out of the batter's box? Everybody in Boston says that, but Manny, to be able to know that that ball is one inch out of the ballpark, right. you know, and you're right. It, <laughs> he just hits the ball and he's so excited in himself that, uh, you know, he can, to inside out the ball and to think it's out of the ballpark, I mean, there's not too many people in the game of baseball who do that. Most guys drive the ball or pull the ball, but right. he has this ability to to undercut the ball with a with a what I call a bottom hand swing, which was Aaron was famous for, and has a very strong bottom hand and can slice the ball out of the ballpark. Now you've been with the Red Sox and you had ups and downs with the team. Now that they've won two World Series in a short period of time. Will the image of tragic heroism be replaced with spoiled corporate? Wow. 
Not in this ball club. No. I don't think that this ownership, there's something about John Henry that seems to be a very humble person and not to be the ego-driven uh, eccentric that Steinbrenner was. You know, right. and I believe they're different. I mean, it seems to be a coalition of four owners that have come together and they, they don't step on one another. They seem to be pretty much in sync on how they're doing it. Uh, they give the kid, Theo, the reins to kind of put the club together. Right. They, but the thing is, John Henry has more money than Steinbrenner. He has a formula on the commodities market. He can go out and make a billion dollars any day he wants to. And why doesn't he? because he's already done it and gotcha. now he just wants to sit back and watch the Red Sox and then he's got into the NASCAR which I don't really agree with but okay. they're going to end up buying Laconia you know the town of the probably the whole state of New Hampshire <laughs> you know <laughs> live free or die and then they're going to be running those uh, left turns. turns right it, NASCAR what does it stand for uh, non-athletic Centered around rednecks, <laughs> non-athletic sports centered around rednecks. <laughs> you know, all they do is make left turns all day long. So. so, with the team salary being inflated, 200 million, will the cost of going to, to a game exceed the reach of the average New Englander? Eventually. Eventually. I think it has to this extent because of supply and demand. You have such a small venue, the demand is so great that uh, there's no. There's no realm of how many people will pay that freight right. to go to that one game. I mean, my daughter's calling me from Memphis. Dad, can you get me two seats for this? And right. I'm going, you know, my girlfriend's going to be doing a seminar in town on this day. And right. they're willing to pay. People, there are more Red Sox fans around the world than I believe almost Yankee fans now. Why is that? Because there's more people originally settled in New England than instead of the, the city of New York. Right. So there is a there is kind of this big apple mentality of New York, but there's kind of a foundational New Englandism across the country that everybody adheres to their roots. It even comes up to Montreal. Well, it does. It you does. Know, because there are a lot of French and English transposed back and forth. I mean, uh, the... Uh, What's the town? Woonsocket, Rhode Island is almost 75% French. Uh, there's a case popular in right. the city of Manchester, especially East Manchester, New Hampshire, which are all mill people. Uh, you have uh, Waltham, Massachusetts, which is a large French uh, settlement. In, uh, and it was back and forth. Uh, the guy that went to jail in our hometown of Craftsbury, uh, the big farm up there, he opened the bank, doesn't speak a word of English. And he smuggled most of his fortune down in the tires of his John Deere tractor when he opened the first bank. Noel Lucier. That's nice. Yeah, wow. and uh, that's a, uh, you know, behind every great fortune is a great crime. <laughs> that's Whether true. it be in the tires of your John Deere tractor. Or the Kennedy family. Oops. Or the Kennedy family, you know, and the Brothmans, which interchanged a lot of uh, alcohol across St. Lawrence Seaway. Yes, Al Capone. Al Capone has that's his true. caves. He came uh, here. Where did he have his caves? Moose Jaw. Moose Jaw, that's right. The end of the Chicago Railroad ends up in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Supposedly where Capone used to smuggle all this stuff. And those right. Flatlanders, you so, gotta watch them. For going from innocent until, innocent until proven guilty, Barry Bonds. Oh my gosh. What a travesty. It's almost like the Jack Johnson case, you know, where he gets, he gets convicted of the Man Act, transporting a white female across borders you know, and sentenced two years after the deed when they finally passed the law. Right. Now they've passed the law on Barry Bonds and, uh, you know, and the semantics behind bovine growth hormone and, uh, and uh, all the other hormones that guys are taking and stuff like that. It's, uh, it's a witch hunt in some respects because right in the back of an airline magazine we saw today that there's that John Glenn, the famous astronaut, is using that substance. And politician. And politician, yeah. true. So it's it's all a matter of, uh, you know, all right, so find out what what is good for society and stuff before you start uh, 
coming down. This is clear, maybe the greatest thing in the world since Ponce de Leon discovered the Fountain of Youth in Florida. <laughs> Will this ruin his chance to go into the Hall of Fame? Oh yeah, it'll. It's. It's it's the same thing like uh, McGuire pleads the Fifth Amendment and cries on a federal stand, you know, and everybody knows in Tom Hanks movie there's no crying in baseball. That's so right. he jeopardized himself that he cried more than the fact that he took the fifth. And what he used at the time and what him and Conseco were using was not a banned substance. It was completely legal until the word got out and then they finally made it illegal and then who says he used it after it was banned uh, a banned sure. substance you know we only have his testimony before and the same with bonds bonds you know did he use a growth hormone probably was it illegal at the time probably not so you can't convict a person of a crime until the law is on the books and that would be my defense for bonds and it may go down did he lie to a grand jury you know Don't i know. think uh, Everybody lies. I know Doc Ellis, every time he opens his mouth, he's lying. He so, didn't pitch that perfect game on acid? He never pitched that perfect game on acid. You can't throw the ball over 12 miles an hour on acid. You're just going to look at the ball going, wow, that's beautiful. <laughs> wow, this is great. I think I'll keep it. Yeah, and since he was probably batting, he must have been terrified at the opposing ball coming at him. Oh. You just don't. Uh, I remember the guy tried to kill Jack Anderson by rubbing LSD on his steering wheel. Oh. You know, and uh, what's that going to do? He's going to make him drive five miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's going to be in more to make the airbags come out. <laughs> right. Deploy. So you know, <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's well, a lot of weird stuff that's happened in this game that uh, makes it an interesting game. You speaking know? of weird, Alex Rodriguez. Oh, Alex. A Rod. A-Rod is coming back to the Yankees, and this is a good thing for Red Sox fans because uh, with him around, you know they'll never win. <laughs> <laughs> he just seems to have a, a bad, bad karma sitting on his shoulder. He should be from A-Rod to the Albatross. Yeah, he's just, <laughs> poor A-Rod, he just, he's a great hitter when the game's not on the line. But uh, you put runners a second and third, and you've got to come up with a single, and... Uh, it's hard to swing that bat with one hand around your throat. <laughs> <laughs> if we were to flash back, big day in baseball history, I'm talking huge. April 14, 1979, the Expos defeat the Cubs 2-0. But most notably, it's the birth of Yuppie. Oh my god. <laughs> what was your first uh, reaction when you saw that big orange furball? Uh, exactly, it looked like something that got caught in a cat's mouth, you know, right <laughs> before he throws up on your... Uh on your sidewalk and stuff and you hope the cat's outside of the house and not on your bed when the fur ball gets stuck in there but uh, it's 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 large big items generate kids love them like the like the other day they'll run up and pet a lion they'll run up and do a lot of stuff yeah. that they probably shouldn't do because of the size and it's it's it was brought on by Disney I think originally you know by Did you haze them? Pardon me? Did you or your teammates ever haze the mascot? No, no. We actually liked the guy when he had his uniform off because he was sweating bullets all the time and he was exhausted and he put on a pretty good show. He was no chicken. He was no Philly fanatic. There were only a few mascots. You could count all the good mascots on one hand. And it wasn't so much that they were a caricature, the fact that they had real personality and they could act a little bit mm. and had spontaneity, that I did not mind. The fact that you were using a large object to try and bring people into the ballpark that really didn't want to go to a baseball game, right. that I objected to. He got under Tommy Lasorda's skin and got ejected. Yes, he did. He got, <laughs> he got under our manager, the Philly Fanatic, got, oh. got under, uh, you know, he wanted Larry Parrish to hit him with a baseball bat. Did he? Kill that son of a bitch. <laughs> Get him, him like that. I'm going, wait a second. This is an inanimate <laughs> object and yours, you know. You're you're get, coming down on the wrong thing. It's a that's a psychological problem there. That's weird, Mr. Fanny. That you know, is weird. You know, <laughs> had to do something with your father figure that you didn't receive something when you were young and uh, 
We know, we know this. If you'd ever read Auto Rank and you'd ever read uh, Denial of Death by Ernest K. Becker or re read any basic Freud, you'd realize that you have a real bad anal retentive problem. <laughs> but <laughs> Let's talk about Canada and the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame. If oh I'm, my gosh, St. Mary's. St. Mary's. If I'm the committee and you're Billy, which you are, yeah. but I'm not the committee, but you're Billy. Well, Voight runs that thing, the guy that used to play for the Windsor Chiefs, Ooh. and he keeps telling me that I'm going to be in there. But the funny thing is, I'm not in the Red Sox Hall of Fame, I'm not in the Expos Hall of Fame. Actually, I was in the Expos Hall of Fame. I had a caricature made of me when it was at the old Olympic Stadium, right. and uh, I was one of the uh, people most endeared because of Petro Canada. Right. Uh, where they passed, they asked all the fans in Canada who they thought should be there, and I, I received a lot of votes from fans. That's good. But not from management. And I will never, uh, like the Red Sox, you know, I'm probably one of the top winningest percentage wise left handers in Red Sox history. I have the most appearances of anyone in Red Sox history. I was a great fielding pitcher. I brought a lot of people to the stands. They loved me, but I'll never make the Red Sox Hall of Fame either because of the fact Politics. that I because of the fact that I'm a I'm a uh, Noam Chomsky a labor uh, manufacturing you know, consent. Exactly. I'm the kind of guy Eugene Debs. You know, I'm the kind of guy that uh, socialist that believes in spreading the wealth and not consolidating into the fists of one person's hand. And that is what really alienates me to a capitalistic society and drives drive management nuts and stuff. But I'm I'm you know, I believe in honest capitalism. Right. I just don't believe in, you know but I'm going to get to that in word association. Okay. It's going to be good. It'll be well, good. I don't I'm not a good word associator. Oh, Sometimes I am but it's okay. It's all right. So what is your, it's a tough question. What are some of your favorite baseball memories in Canada? Oh, heck. I was going to say the. Hitting the home run in uh, St. John's, Newfoundland to beat Saskatchewan in the Quebec. I played for Team Quebec. Do you enjoy batting? I, I enjoy hitting more than anything else. You know, it's the hardest thing to do. It takes timing. You've got to get the right pitch. You've got to deliver. Uh, pitching is repetition cardiovascular hard work and I'm good at it and I'm persistent but hitting is something hitting in the clutch is some of the hardest things in the world to do and uh, hitting I think is the most difficult thing in all of professional sport to do because if you hit three out of ten base hits you can go to the Hall of Fame and then therefore you failed seven out of ten times you know and I've always thought hitting the defense never sleeps Right. Hitting is something is desire and uh, hard work and repetition. Pete Rose, uh, Manny Ramirez, Freddie Lynn, some of the most beautiful swings in baseball, you know. And uh, but that's that must have upset you with the DH rule. And well, the DH really hurt me because I liked to swing the bat when I was in high school and in college. And uh, I hit for the cycle when I was I hit a single, double, triple, and a home run against the University of Oregon. I uh, had some really great games in, in college, you know, and I had some great games in the pros. Probably my favorite game was when I beat the Chicago White Sox in a really torrential rainstorm Ooh. by throwing nothing but slow stuff. It's in here. Yeah, yes. exactly. And the time that I pitched to a loaded with hash and the ability to, to be able to overcome when you've, or, you've over toxicity in your body that you can win when you're hurt. Juan Marichal was the, one of the great pitchers because he could always win when he didn't feel good. You know, and anybody can win when they feel good, but can you win when you feel poor? I won, I won three games last year in the over 60 world championship on a bum knee. Ooh. You know, and I, and I have that bum knee today and uh, I paid the price and, and literally in the last two nights I've told myself that I am not going to play again if it entails living in this kind of pain. But I believe I believe I have hunting reflex, which is a, a thing that runners get when Diane they, disagrees. She does, she does. We that's we did we You agree to disagree? We agree to disagree. She she says, I say, are you confused? <laughs> and and uh, that's one of the great books that I read by Pablo Ar Ariola. 
that makes her gag, <laughs> who's a Brazilian, that looked really good. And it's got chapters like, is milk your friend or your fiend? <laughs> Coffee enemas. Things like weird stuff that they uh, did back in the old days. But actually the Kellogg family and the Post family and uh, the Road to Wellness. Right. Serials were all based on some ways. To Your teammate to... Ferguson Jenkins in every Hall of Fame. Yes, he's in the Canadian Hall of Fame. He is. Thing is, has Fergie hit a home run in every Canadian province? I don't think so. Has Fergie thrown a complete game in every Canadian province? I don't think so. I threw a seven-inning complete game in 54 minutes in Fergie's hometown. No way. Yeah. How come he doesn't get on the phone and try and get you in? Well, Fergie's, once those guys get in the Hall of Fame, it's, uh, there's only so much in the pot. And if you get more people in the Hall of Fame, the pot gets oh, it diffused. Dilutes. So uh, the Hall of Famers are really notoriously, uh, they've got really short arms and really long pockets. Uh, <laughs> I have to ask this because I'm going to get in trouble if I don't, yeah. but you don't have to answer it again. Uh, someone was upset that I didn't have the camera on when I mentioned Doug Harvey. You met him some way, somehow. Oh, yeah. Canadian's defenseman, fall from grace, cautionary tale, great player. Well, Doug Harvey, the last time I saw him, he had a hunting knife, about a seven-day growth of beard. He was sitting on a hillside outside of... Sussex, New Brunswick, where we had just going to play a softball game with Eddie Fainer and the king of his court. And I had my children with me, and this crusty old guy walks up to me and he goes, you're Bill Lee? And I said, yeah. He says, Eddie Fainer? I said, yes, Eddie Fainer's going to be here. I played against Eddie Fainer. And then he says, you know, the greatest experience I ever had, the greatest award I ever had, was I won the, the Ottawa Baseball League. I led that league in hitting, and Hillary and Bradditch sent him a silver bat mm. because the fact that he led the league in hitting. And I went, who are you? He goes, oh, I'm Doug Harvey. And I went, the Doug Harvey? He goes, yeah. He says, did they fine you when they released you that last day in Montreal? I said, I believe they did. He says, that's illegal. Because oh. he was a player rep too. Right. Right. And he goes, they can, they can fine you. Or they can release you, but they can't do both. They double dipped on you. They double dipped on me, and then he told me the story about you know about missing the the charter flight and ended up on a, a boat with a sea captain out of New York, and they ended <laughs> up having a he missed a three games because they 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 found him about 400 miles off the coast of Halifax. <laughs> and I'm going, you know, I. I missed a few games, but I'd never been on a ship that far out in the Atlantic. No. <laughs> he was great. He was great. And he, I guess he was dead about three months later. Oh. You know. Cirrhosis. Yeah, he was pretty bad shape. He looked kind of pale and pasty and stuff. But uh, With all the accolades and there's articles about you, if I went on the web, somebody is name dropping you or there's an article about you, what's the biggest misconception that the public may have of you? That... I'm flaky, you right. know, because they think that uh, he's left-handed, he's crazy, that uh, he's different. But I said, what do you expect out of a North Paw world? Mm. You know, and uh, that the powers that be, they want to make you seem unacceptable to the masses, you know, because it's not right because of what I believe in. But uh, I think there's a method to my madness that I'm well-founded, I'm... You know, I'm, I've got a lot of foundational uh, statistics to back up the way I think. Right. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll debate any subject, any time, with anybody. Mm. And that's, you know... That's good. That's, that's the whole thing. And, and I, will, uh, I will use their argument against them. I think I could have been a good debater. Yeah, I was a master debater. Yeah, you knew I was coming. <laughs> <laughs> During the course of 2006, you, along with Oil Cam Boyd, traveled the country playing ball games. What was it like being with them, and what was the mission statement? Oh, wow. Can put together a team, and then when I saw the lineup, I was the only white guy on the team. I'm going, <laughs> Can, am I the token white guy on this tip? And he goes, I'll, Don't worry, Bill. I'll compensate you. I'll take care of you and stuff. So I played like five games with him. 
He gave me 150 bucks. And I went, mm. wow, I drove 3,000 miles. I put myself up in my own hotel room. I fed myself. Now I know what it's like to be a slave. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, he goes, can't. I go, and the funny thing is, I go out to pitch against the Nashua Pride after a tornado disrupted our first game down in uh, the Brockton Rocks. And uh, I get out and I warm up. It's 49 degrees. And his bus is late getting there because they got caught in an accident on 495. So he shows up about 20 minutes late. I'm warmed up, ready to go. He says, Bill, you're not starting. I said, can't. It's 49 degrees. I'm warmed up. But he says, well, we got another game. I said, I can't really shut it down at my age and expect to start it back up again. And so, uh, I'm sorry, Bill, you're not pitching. So I said, okay. I picked all my stuff up, went in, took a nice shower at Nashville. I had that really good old-time stadium pressure. And uh, got cleaned up, went out, bought a bottle of tequila. Oh, nice. Diane and I went back to a hotel room and uh, I don't know what we watched, probably watched the Red Sox and sipped on tequila and uh, and Can dropped a double header and then Can goes, Bill, you walked out on me. I went, yeah, I did. <laughs> I said, I walked out on the Expos, I walked out on the Red Sox, you were easy. Monkey mates. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then two days later he calls me and he got a game in Quebec City and he goes, Bill, we need you to pitch in Quebec City. And I go, Quebec City? I'll go. <laughs> so we drove all the way up to Quebec City and they stayed in some flea bag hotel down off the mountain. And we stayed in the uh, the Hotel Fontenac. Oh, nice. I got a beautiful room. I had never been to Quebec City. We did the fendicular. We went out. I went out and pitched the ball game. Had two good innings and then they just ripped me. Ooh. They had about four Cubans on the team. I can't get Cubans out. I can't get anybody out that's got a vowel at the end of their name. <laughs> but it was good. It was a good experience. No and Italian baseball league for you. I, I tried. I tried to get in there. But when Remerschwall, the old Red Sox pitcher, ended up taking my job, I was going to pitch for San Marino, that little principality up on the top of the mountain where they have the Grand Prix. But the tour was to spread awareness for the upcoming Urban Baseball League? Is that it? I don't think so. No? This is Can talking. Uh -huh. Okay. This is Ken trying to do stuff for Ken. <laughs> he calls me up. This is a good story. This is Ken. He goes, Bill, I hear, there's a game, the DiMaggio game. Uh, how much they pay? And I said, oh, a thousand bucks. You know, I said, oh, count me in. I said, okay, Ken. He says, but I'm on the Red Sox cruise. I'm on the boat. That's and we're going to be off the coast of San Juan. I said, so you're going to miss it. You know, you, you, oh, I'll get back. I said, what are you going to do? Jump off the cruise ship? <laughs> I said, you're out in the Caribbean. And then finally, he's worked it out. They're going to drop him off a day early. He's going to fly from San Juan to Fort Lauderdale. He's going to get there in the second inning, and they're going to give him 500 bucks. Nice. You know, I go, that's can. And I'm going, you know, he is just... He can do. He can do. He's going to try and do it. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, he's, the, he's the modern day Satchel Page, you know. But the money's got to be on the table for Can. No, that's he's, right. he's not doing this for uh, pro bono. He ain't doing this for the urban interleague. Dress them up, uh, get those kids uh, out of the crack dance. <laughs> let's play baseball. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm glad you did the segue to Satchel Page. Let's talk about weird pitches and their legacy. Oh, Satchel. Yeah. I heard an interview with uh, Simon. Uh, on national public radio one day, and I had to pull off the road. It was so beautiful. I was poignant, and I almost cried. Uh, you know, I always wanted to be Satchel Paige, you know, or at least play as many games or try to win as many games. And uh, I think I'm getting up there. That's good. You know, but I think I, I've, unless I get my left knee fixed in the next couple of days, uh, I could postpone it. I just don't like, I, I'm the kind of guy when I want to go to bed, I go to sleep. And the last two days I have not been able to sleep. And, and this is a rare event for me. I mean, I'm 61 years old almost, and this is the first two nights I haven't been able to sleep. <laughs> and I said, I might give up baseball for sleep. <laughs> and then as Warren Zevon said, I'll sleep when I'm dead. You That's know, right. So, so, That's, so let's um, talk about Satchel for a second, because oh, you're yeah. a pitcher. I, he's I'm a pitcher. A, yes. Or was a pitcher. 
What is the hesitation pitch? When you wind up and then you stop and then you throw. Is that illegal? No. It's not a block? No. You can be smooth and, and boom. Out of a stretch, you have to, once you, you it's, it's all a matter of semantics. Do you really stop? Not really. Not really? Like they say, did you come to a stop? No one really comes to a stop. You come down there and your hands are still moving. Right. Imperceptibly. You think <laughs> you're holding them still, but as long as you've got a pulse <laughs> and you're not rigor mortis, as in said, and you're moving. And I tried to explain that to an umpire and he goes, that's a little deep for me, Bill. And I go, but Satchel, that's a hesitation. They had Long Tom, he had his little curveball. Which, had this. this one sounds like a rock song. The Four Day Rider. The Four Day Rider. Yeah. Which uh, one's that? I don't know what that is. I was trying to find it. And he has the Trouble Ball and the Ball Be Ball. The Ball Be Ball. Yeah, the Ball Be Ball. Wow. Yeah. But that's okay, because moving along. What? That's funny, because I, I, I do the same. I have, a, I have a little slow curve. I have the three-quarter curve. I have the sidearm curve. You know, I have the hesitation drop down. Looks like a curve, but I end up jamming left-handers all day long. I wear their thumbs out. Mm. I call it my Carlos May fastball, because he only he lost part of his thumb in a mortar accident when he was in the Marine Corps. Right. So I always tried to get in his kitchen because he was missing one digit. <laughs> <laughs> but he could hit. He, that other hand was strong. How about the screwball? I mean, that's just a funny name. Screwball is just a, here's your fastball. Right. This is your curve. Screwball is what I call an Egyptian, you know, you get your arms out and go, that's screwball in parts with your thumb spinning Can you break your arm way. doing that? No, no, you just get on top of it and come, show fastball, pull it down, slow it down, throw it about 15 miles slower than your fastball and it fades away. It's like Christy Matheson threw a fade away, Carl Hubble threw a fade away. You know, some guys faded away harder than others, you know. Oh, really? Yeah, Glavin throws a fade away, Maddox throws a fade away, oh. you know. Clements, when he slows it down, he can ride that fastball away. That could be a hard fade away. But uh, the screwball is just in part spin the other way. You have one seam that rolls all the way around. And being able to take that ball and make it a do. We are called cunny thumbers, like that. Uh, yes, it's in here. It's in that one, yeah. Don't that was Google it because it might be something dirty. Well, that's exactly what it was. <laughs> a cunny is a rabbit. Ooh. That's where it comes from in old England. And you can look up Cunny, Cunny Thummer, you can look it up and there'll be on the web, there'll be a, totally, it'll go to a porno site, probably. <laughs> probably. But uh, that's what my dad, and funny thing is I asked my dad that and he said, no, I never said that to you. So where did that come from? But parents are lying that all the time. I'll tell my parents who said this, I never said that. <laughs> Emmanuel Wall, you must have been dreaming again. Exactly. Making, I never said that. And I believe in Dr. Penfield. Everything that's ever been said to you is in your brain. Everything you've ever experienced like is in drive. your brain. It's in your hard drive. Yeah. And if you can take a metal rod and hit those neurons, Every memory, everything that you've ever done will come back. Yeah. That would not be a good thing for me. No. <laughs> <laughs> I do not no. want to relive. You remember what happened? No, I blacked out. Don't remember. Don't remember. Forgetting is a great asset. It is. Phil and Joe Negro mastered the knuckleball. Yes. Now, is that a weird pitch? I mean, a knuckleball is... I hate the knuckleball because I have a good one. I threw it. Funny thing is, I beat San Jose this fall out in Arizona, the team that had beaten me two years before in the father's son, I came out and had to pitch the second game of a doubleheader and we had to win that game and I was exhausted and I said, ah, oh, hell with it, I'll just throw knuckleballs. Right. And I ate them up with that knuckleball. Nice. I ate them up with that knuckleball. But the thing is, when the wind's right and you're throwing it and you have the right ball, it's just, it's the fate. Does an emery board help the knuckleball? No, the knuckleball, you want that ball not to have any blemishes on it. Right. The cleaner, the purer the ball and the seams, the more it will flutter and dance. Mm. And you can pronate it with this finger and it'll go down and away. You can push it with this finger and it'll go down and in. You can get underneath of it like uh, Wakefield and you can make it ride up. You th he see he's got a, a fast knuckleball, a slow knuckleball, a slower knuckleball, right. and 
and he doesn't know where they're going, the hitter doesn't know where they're going, the umpire doesn't know where they're going, but if he throws the first one for a strike, you can make them, the hitter all of a sudden start swinging at bad pitches, and that's when Wakefield has a good year. When it's ball one, ball two, then Wakefield has to throw a straight ball, and his straight ball is only 74 miles an hour. So they're spanking it. They're spanking it. It's called meat. Nice, nice. So what's, a, what's a leafist pitch? That's a slow curve ball that I try to make break straight down through the strike zone. I like it to hit the front shoulder, go right through the heart of the plate, and land up right on the ground on the back leg. And thereby, umpires always call it a ball. Right. But I'm saying, at one point in time, that ball was in the strike zone. And that's at one point. At one point. Doesn't but, have to be in the strike zone all the time. But did it was in the strike zone when it crosses the plate. That's exactly, when it crosses the plate. Is that similar to an Ephus pitch? Same thing. But, Ephus was thrown by Rip Sewell without spin. He got down and shot put it up and tried to make it drop straight down. Right. Mine has rotation, which is actually uh, an improvement on the Ephus pitch. Because if you have the wind in your face and you throw it properly, once it creates drag, it starts breaking straight down. It's almost impossible. Did you create that or is it by accident? It's just by knowing physics okay. and knowing that when it's raining, hitters don't like to look up in the rain, having to wait for this thing to blink. drop. Exactly. It makes them blink. And I found out that you have to swing harder on a slow pitch to hit it further, thereby you're making guys go outside of the realm of their good swing. And it's a great pitch for kids to learn. Doesn't hurt your arm, you no. know, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an anti-authority pitch. Oh. I pitched that pitch and I remember both managers wanted to fight me. The opposing manager and my manager, who right. thought I was showing up their hitters, right. both of them did, because managers are hitters very seldom are they pitchers. But they're normally not too they, good hitters. Exactly. They like to be challenged. Okay. Hitters like to be challenged. They hate it when you don't challenge them. Okay. They always yell at you. Come on, I'm Come on. Exactly. Come on, let's mano a mano. I'm going, yeah. why? You're big, strong, you lift weights. Why would I... You know, right, why would I play to your strength? Why would I play to your strength, you dumb hitter? <laughs> is there... Okay, keeping the hitter versus pitcher. Is there like a... Like a Freemason group of pitchers who all conspire against hitters? All pitchers conspire against hitters. Right, even if, if you're... If we in... find out that one guy can't hit a breaking ball, three games down the league, this guy's out of the league, and he says, how did all those pitchers know I couldn't hit a breaking ball? Like Bo Jackson couldn't hit a curveball. Boom, 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 boom. It's like drums. They go out through the league. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. <laughs> guy chases high fastball. <laughs> Next thing they think, it's on the web. That's right. The web was out there way before the web. Pitchers. Always. Pitchers had a network. Pitchers have a network. We're the guys that have to run. We have to shag. We have to pick up the balls. We have to bring them here. We have to do that. Pitchers are like privates in the Army. There's a whole <laughs> bunch of them. You know? Right. There's only a couple third basemen. Right. You know? and there's, only, there's only these hitters out there. and they, they, they think we're out there just to serve their purpose. Ted Williams used to say that all the time. You're just here to serve me? Just here to serve Pick you. my bags and shut up? Exactly. And, uh, nice. You know, well, we, not so nice. We never really adhere to that. Pitchers, we have a union. You we do? Have a union within a union. It's and, like a uh, cabal. Yeah. Wow. It is. Which would explain why pitchers develop the spitball. Is that like, <laughs> here, hit this, when you hurt you? Well, when you hurt your arm, let's say you're pitching and all of a sudden you used to throw the ball and it moved, but now you've hurt your arm, you can't throw the velocity to make it move anymore. Right. You go right to the slippery elm, you chew that, you start using KY gel in your hat, <laughs> the Ross Grimsley, you know. You hit the ball to third and the spire pick it up and throw it in the stands. Why? He says, well, I got it on the wet side. Now the ball squirts out and then you can't throw the ball to first base. So if Vaseline's off the market, pitchers are out of the job? Bad pitchers are out of the job. <laughs> Good right. pitchers stand up, but when you get hurt, you'll try anything to stay in this union, you know, you want to... It's better, would you like to dig at Leech Field by hand, or would you like to ride in first class and make $95,000 a year? As minimum salary. As minimum salary. I think I'll go for door number two. Right. Yeah. What's the gyro ball? That is... You know, funny thing is, the gyro ball is a, a backup slider that's cut by Matsuzaka. Right. And 
it's you throw the slider, but he gets his elbow in here and it spins. It spins like a screwball and backs up on him. Because it sounds like something you eat. Yeah, a gyro <laughs> ball. And basically it is, it's a it's a slow slider that he undercuts with his elbow and it backs up. It's it's a bad pitch, but if you if you when a hitter sees spin, he assumes it's gonna break away from him. Right. But this ball spins and it backs up and it jams him and stuff. But the funny thing is, because it's slow and if he gets it up, good hitters don't get jammed by slow stuff. They don't. No, they crush it. They crush it. Were That's you ever crushed? He, oh yeah. Was I, there a nemesis that you can never get out or had better performance yeah. against you than someone else? Yeah, I would say Bill Matlock, I couldn't get him out, Thurman Munson. They stayed back. They kept their hands back, and I didn't quite throw hard enough to get the ball by them, and they were great off-speed hitters. Great off-speed hitters can hit me good, mm -hmm. and most of your Latinos are good off-speed hitters because no one's so hot down there, no one throws that hard very much. Right. Everybody learns the breaking ball south of South America because it's so hot. hot. And now it's all about speed. Well, velocity is great. It, it, yeah, there's no substitute for velocity, but if you're throwing hard all the time... You're one-dimensional. You're one-dimensional. Reggie Jackson used to say, I can time a jet. Nice. He could, he could hit them dead I didn't rest. know he could tell time. <laughs> Alright, let's do... I had fun with this last time. I've changed it up just a bit. Classic and Contemporary Word Association, but they won't always be proper names. So they're going to be rapid fire. Dazzy... No, Daffy Dazzy Dizzy Ducky. <laughs> Medwick. <laughs> Dean, Dean, Medwick. They're all uh, St. Louis Cardinals. They're all crazy. They're all the crazy. gas house gang. That's, uh, uh, there's no, no one has nicknames like that anymore. No one has nicknames like that. Daffy, Daffy Dazzy Dizzy Ducky. Isn't that great? And some, yeah, I'm, so I'm sure someone was known as Dashing somewhere. John Henry of the Red Sox. John Henry. Sounds like a steel driving man, but he's so soft. He's like, he's, he's just, he's, he's just ethereal, you know, as, as an owner, and he's so nice, you know. He doesn't remind me of your traditional owners. How about Branch Rickey? Ooh, Branch Rickey, the Methodist, uh, Bible thumping, you know, you know, and everything. He, he supposedly he just wanted to win. And he knew the timing was right to bring in right. Jackie Robinson. Who played for the Royals. Yes, he did. In Montreal. So I think he was a, Branch was an opportunist, but a good baseball player. Oh, good. Curse of the Billy Goat. Curse of the Billy Goat. That's Chicago, you know, that's Chicago White Sox when they didn't let that guy bring the goat in. Is it the White Sox or the Cubs? Oh, Cubs. Sorry, you're right. It's a Cubby. That's a, the, curse of the, the curse of the goat is the, is the Cubby's curse. Not like the Curse of the Bambino, which has been rectified. But that's cooler than the Curse of the Goat. Because well, I got the Billy Goat Curse. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, what is it? What is it? Um, what's it, Woody Allen? Right. All you wanted to know about sex, but were afraid to ask. Right. You know, what do Cup fans do with that goat? <laughs> what the, you know, like, Interleague play. Interleague play was created to try and get attendance up, but it became a uh, you know pretty neat thing because you get to see other you know you get to see other games played without the designated hitter, and you get to see all the other players. It, it's very hard on the on the players today because there's more travel, their schedules more erratic, but, but they get compensated so much now. You know, true. I think that's a that's a small price to pay for what yeah, they yeah suck it up. Suck it up, boys, yeah. Yeah, I noticed the American League teams do better than the National League teams. Because of the designated hitter rule and the fact that the American League teams spend more money on hitters. But they win the All-Star Games and World Series. Now. Yes, they do, and that's because of the fact that they've uh, got more talent. Right. One through nine than the National League. National League still plays little ball defense and stuff, and uh, you know they just can't. I don't think they can put a lineup out there like right. The Federal League. The Federal League, wow. That was the old American League, I think, when it's, they... Uh, a third be, rival league. Oh, the third rival league that came out, right. And then they... And they got sued. Well, uh, exactly, but the, you got to realize that uh, the owners are trying, they'll always try to sneak something else in there and stuff, you know. You had the... Uh, 
what was the the American Football League, right? And then they became part of the uh, NFL. Super Bowl, and then the NFL, and then it's. But the federal leagues claim to fame are Wrigley Field, and baseball is uh, prevented with the antitrust. You can't sue Major League Baseball for antitrust. Oh, I did not know that. That's neat. Well, I knew the antitrust thing was out there, you know, and that's why they can depreciate you. If they pay A-Rod $26 million, they can depreciate his salary. Mm. And therefore, they don't have to pay taxes on him as an asset. Oh. And that's a big thing about the antitrust. What's this strange group here? The Royal Order of the Buffalo Heads. Oh, the Royal <laughs> Order of the Buffalo Heads, created by the great Canadian Ferguson Jenkins, who said the buffalo was the dumbest animal on the planet. Indians used to run them off of cliffs, head smashed in Alberta. They didn't even waste arrows on them. Oh. Well, they just get them going over there and direct them over a cliff and those things will just keep running over that cliff. Ooh. Meat will pile up. <laughs> the dynamic duo of Sandy Koufax and Dan Drysdale. Oh man. They were the first two to hold out and try to get a million dollars between them with the Dodgers because they were the number one and two pitchers in the National League. Oh. And they were the, the first real holdouts during spring training and Walt O'Malley would have nothing to do with that. Oh really? Yeah, but they, they ended up compensating them very well and they were well worth it. You know, they were the first two holdouts that I knew of. That's cool. Alright, so right here, the wrong stuff. Originally published in 1984, republished in 2004. Yes. The funniest book to come out since Ball Four. Right. And Ball Four wasn't funny, according to the Yankees. No, Mickey Mantle a drunk? Yeah, <laughs> Mickey Mantle a womanizer. Who knew? Who knew? You know? But why? Well, I know one. And, uh, <laughs> what was uh, Karen Clink? Right. Who went out with him when she was 16 years old, told me about the experience. And then I ended up meeting Karen Clink <laughs> at a pool in Baltimore when she was dating uh, one of the Oakland A's. Held that name out there for you big guy so you don't get in trouble with your old lady. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, Clank, uh, she comes up to me and uh, I end up going out with her for a while and uh, she worked in the commissioner's office. Whoa, so I had inside fun. information. I had a mole in the commissioner's office. Who was office. the commissioner? Uh, that would be Bowie Kim. And her and her girlfriend uh, used to double date with all the teams out there and stuff. And, uh, <laughs> then about 12 years ago, a guy runs up to me and he goes, Hey, you know me? I go, no. He says, I'm Karen Klink's husband. Ooh. And I said, well, you, I, and the Mick have something in common. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, holy How do you come up that's... You about writing the book. Were you approached or did you say, hey, I want to write a book? I was approached. All right. I was approached by Lolly, who is uh, the guy out of New York City that writes a lot of guides and loves baseball. And he's, he's, he's very, very informative and gives me a lot of information. But How long did it take to write the book? Four days. Four days? <laughs> hey, congratulations. Yeah. We wrote this in a cabin in Quebec, <laughs> up uh, outside of Sutton, Quebec. And it was done, bang, dupe, and then uh, I got upset with uh, the publisher and everybody else because I went to play in, in Latin America and they never got me to read the Bound Classic. And the end of the book, it had some disparaging things against Mary Lou, my first wife, and I really apologized to her after that and stuff because she was a great lady and uh, there's nothing I can say that, uh, you know, she's really helped me out a lot. You know, and we've gotten along good with the kids, and I've got all the grandkids and stuff. And uh, you know, she nice. put up with me for all those years, and uh, that's something to her uh, stick to itiveness. <laughs> right. So I, I, I don't leave people. They it, tend to hit me with a shovel. <laughs> in the book, you mentioned your approach to be part of the ERA movement. The equal. It, equal, yeah, equal rights amendment. Yeah. In the 1970s. Was that just someone calling you up and saying, hey? Oh, yeah. Normal called me for the normalization of marijuana legislation. Uh, Fair Share wanted to, to do a lot of stuff. Mass Commission Against Discrimination. Uh, mass Commission Against Handguns. 
I've worked for a myriad of causes, common cause, all these things that were way out before Al Gore. You know, I believed in global warming in 1969. Al Gore invented global warming. No, he didn't. Night the Meadows, <laughs> actually, all these people, had professors out of Harvard where he went to school. They're the ones, you know, and uh, Al yeah. Gore, is, he's late to the party. He invented Harvard. He invented Harvard. <laughs> and the internet. Yeah. And, and, uh, no. He's, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's... When you put the book together, was there any, like, ball four? Did you anticipate any backlash? People calling you up saying, how can you write this? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, it's the wrong stuff. Right. You know, I'm not the right stuff. I parodied it. I got the title right because I wanted it to be, uh, you know, about spam in a can, about right. the space program and everything else. If, if uh, astronauts are not the right stuff, Right. The test pilots were the right stuff. If anybody ever watches the Wolf movie, they realize that astronauts are just spam in a can. <laughs> these are guys that just get sent up there and they're anal retentive and they, they do all these weird tests on them just like uh, if they were chimps and stuff like that. You know, I, and except with Apollo 13, which really had to be innovative and uh, to bring that crew back. Uh, that was probably the greatest, the greatest thing in, uh, in American flight, or at least extraterrestrial flight, I think, and that's, I would applaud them. Go on, uh, you know, why would you want to go to the moon? Yeah, seriously. Uh, seriously. <laughs> I mean, holy cow, it's <laughs> cold, it's hot, no water. I have a theory, I, I have a theory, it's called testosterone. Yeah. You go into any club. I've been to the moon. Who wants to go home with me? <laughs> I'll show you a moon. Yeah. <laughs> moon over Vermont. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's like uh, it's 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 funny. Our our society is. Uh, How'd you become a five-year-old arson? Arsonist? Yeah, an arsonist. Knew where the matches were. <laughs> Mom smoked. Yeah. Mom smoked. She couldn't hide those matches from me for long, you know. And I just loved to light a fire. <laughs> Who is Rockwell Dennis Hunt? Oh, that would be my grandpa. My great-grandpa. Rockwell Dennis Hunt was one of the founders of... Uh, he moved the College of the Pacific from San Jose to Stockton and combined two colleges together and he was also named Mr. California by Governor Knight. He was 98 years old when he died. He wrote a bunch of books, his, history books. He knew John Muir. He knew a lot of the uh, founding fathers of California and he was a, just a historian, a teacher and uh, I, I got that from him and uh, originally his father was from Vermont. Oh, Which kind of goes work. around, comes around. Nice. And now you had a family member who was a locksmith. That would be Grover, Grover Souter, who was uh, Malibu Lock and Key, and before that he was Hollywood Lock and Key. And you were and Grover's course. Lock and Key, and I, I learned uh, the intricacies of breaking and entering at a very early age. That, could, with your background in lighting things on fire, could come in handy. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> how to get out of a burning building, you know, and uh, usually use the doorknob. But uh, I could pick locks, you know, if a, if a, if a, if, if a Schlage is master key, right. I can get in and... 15 and in, seconds. And one of his clients was Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes was. He used to try and break into uh, all these uh, damsel in distress type things. And I think my grandfather showed him the intricacies of breaking and entering also. Did you ever meet Howard Hughes? Never met Howard Hughes. I met a lot of the other guys that hung around uh, Grover's Key Service. William Holden. And, right. uh, who's the guy who had the, the driving gloves? The one, the poster I have in my house. Oh, Lee Marvin. Lee Marvin. I just met Lee Marvin. I met a lot of people that I used know, to hang out. I know why you didn't meet Howard Hughes. His plane's made out of wood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Howard, uh, you know, I, 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 I met a lot of people, you know. I've been around uh, the block. Of, I'm a Hollywood kid, you know. I'm the wrong stuff. That's right. After the 75 World Series, you visited China. What were some of the circumstances in going there? I was brought in by a group called Guardian Magazine out of London, which was a really left-wing paper, and uh, Dr. Harry Edwards, still Shinnick, who drove Patty Hearst to the farmhouse, a bunch of uh, Oberlin College co-eds. It was more of a, a socio, a friendship first, competition second tour, right. to be the first athletes to go and extend an olive branch to the Chinese. 
you know, that's and, good. Uh, and that's what I was part of. Dick, uh, George Stark from the Redskins. There were a lot of great athletes on that tour, and I was, I was one of them, and uh, I got to go and uh, see the real big red machine. That's true. Is that where you started to pick up some of the Eastern philosophies from that trip? I think I had them before that. Right. That was 75, 76. Right. I was into yoga and uh, the Cleveland Library when I got into Paramahasa Yogananda and uh, George Ivanovich Gurdjieff and Ospinsky and some of those uh, Caucasus Mountains kind of old, old Gilgamesh uh, epic type things where I was storytelling and I learned. Uh, I learned there, you know, you learn from the old mythology, the Joseph Campbell and things that I had grown up with that kind of influenced my foundation on uh, mythology and man and, uh, you know, and uh, what is Hitchens just right? God is not great. You know? <laughs> and he's taken a lot of heat from that. But, you know, I, I believe in God and I believe she's pissed. <laughs> Well, she might elect a woman president, maybe. <laughs> okay, I'm going to close off on the wrong stuff here. Bernie Car Herb Carbo and Rodney Scott. Yeah, they're, uh, as the, the old saying in the movie, I, I stuck up for Bernie Carbo with the Red Sox, and it cost my job with the Red Sox. And with the Expos, I stuck up for uh, uh, Rodney Scott, and that cost my job in baseball. But some say you, you put your neck out on the line for, at best, mediocre players. Was, yeah. Uh, were they mediocre or did they offer something? At the time they, they were uh, sensational players. Dick Williams yeah. said that Rodney was our most valuable player for uh, three years in a row. And, and Bernie, Car uh, Bernie Carbo hit some of the clutches pitch hits in the history of the game. And right. in 1978 not one Red Sox pitch hitter drove in a run after Carbo was traded. Mm. And we lost by one game to the New York Yankees. Oh. And it's Casey Singer. So it's said. the little things. You can look it up. It's the little things. Baseball is a, it's an amazing thing. If Roberts doesn't steal second base off of Mariano Rivera, the Red Sox don't win in 2004. Mm. Little things. I it's see. the little things. It's the, it's the combination of the team put together. That could be a follow-up book. Well, it's the little thing. What college did you go to and what was your major? I went to the University of Southern California. I was a pre-dentistry major starting out and uh, then I realized I didn't have trig, I didn't have a lot of the, the courses that I should have gotten in high school to matriculate. So I switched to a liberal arts and uh, went into geography and geology. Then I realized I didn't have trig for geology so I uh, stuck with geography and got a degree in geography and uh, you know was working on my master's in political geography when I got thrown out of Hattiesburg which is uh, no big thing. <laughs> how Gold, was, go Golden Eagles! <laughs> how, how was campus life at the time? This is in the 1960s. Oh campus life? I was scared to death. I hated it. I, I lived in uh, this small dormitory uh, I lived with this redneck from uh, named Fry from uh, Colorado, and all he liked to do was lay on his back and light farts with a Bic lighter. <laughs> Actually, what a Bic was a Zippo. And uh, there's not much happening in college campus life. And I used to run away. I cried. I ran away to my uncle's house. I'd always go out to Malibu and uh, work picking locks. I, I like meticulous little work like that. Uh, you know. I liked a little work, and I was good, uh, but I hated school. But if you didn't go there, chances are you wouldn't have made it to the big leagues? Oh, I never would have made it to the big leagues if I don't go to USC and meet Rod Dato. How do you Rod change? Dato got, I had the desire, I had the stick to that I learned from the DNA of both my grandparents and my dad and my aunt and everybody, but Rod polished it up to a perfection of an intelligence in the game which allowed me being a mediocre athlete to really be a devastating pitcher uh, psychologically and mentally and that that honed it out in other words I was not that great physically but uh, I'll steal all your candy <laughs> you know and you won the college world series won the college world series and uh, that was my I had really good 
perseverance. I was able to throw all the time, all, always wanted the ball, you know, never ducked an assignment. And uh, there was an article Zim wrote that uh, Lee's a quitter, and then a guy from the Hartford Current wrote a great article, Lee's no quitter, Zim, and he went down the line of all the times that I took the ball, you oh. know, and all the times, and I really thank that writer from Hartford that, uh, and it's one of the great articles written about me, Lee's no quitter, and uh, put that in your pipe and smoke it, Zimmer. <laughs> <laughs> but you got along with him. With, um, I got along with Zimmer when he was a coach. Right. I just did not get along with him when he was a manager because oh. he the Peter Principle allows you to rise to the level of your incapabilities and that's what happened to him as a manager because he's he was hamstrung by being a little red-ass middle infielder <laughs> and third baseman and stuff. And, and he has a steel plate in his hand. He had, he hated it. I told Zim the only thing, Zim you know one thing about pitching. He goes, what's that Bill? I went, it's hard to hit. Because <laughs> you know, I could change speed. He's the kind of guy I would never challenge him. And right. He always wanted to be challenged. Everybody wants to, hitters want to be challenged, but if you can get them out without challenging them, why challenge them? Exactly. So while in college, did anyone say, Bill, we know you love baseball, but the big leagues just isn't for you? Oh, yeah, Al Campanis. Oh. Al Campanis of the Dodgers said I'd never pitch in the big leagues. Ooh. That goes to show what kind of general manager he was. <laughs> but I believe every general manager has his day, and I think he was a good general manager with certain ball clubs, and then the Peter Principle. You finally get up, and then you start believing your own press clippings, and that's what happens when uh, guys fall, you know. Uh, you know, hubris. That's what Icarus and uh, Daedalus, you know. You fly too close to the sun, you know, and uh, eventually... Uh, you know, the three fates, you can never, you can never get away from the three fates. It's athos, pathos, and lethos. And uh, if you try, you know, as Aristotle said, luck is when the arrow hits the guy next to you. <laughs> <laughs> the three fates sounds like a Greek restaurant. The three fates, that'd be a good video game. Yeah. Mm. The three fates. The you like that? Yeah, I do. Let's talk about the astronaut and the traditional rebel, which is an oxymoron in terms. Yeah. You're traditionalist, but you're a rebel. Yeah, that was by Palakis, who wrote, uh, he wrote a, a thesis at Bowling Green University called Bill Lee, the Rebel uh, Hero in American Sport. And it's a beautiful piece of writing. He calls me the Osarian, the only sane mind in a game of... of uh, you know, idiocy in some respects, and uh, just like war, and, and uh, yeah, Placus, I can't remember what it says. It's in the Journal of Popular Culture, 1987, mm -hmm. and you can look it up, and it's a great article, and uh, it's probably the greatest thing ever written about me, and uh, the most flattering thing ever written about me. That's cool. And there's iconic pictures of you in an astronaut outfit winding up the throw. Yeah, that was on Sports Illustrated. They wanted a cover piece for their thing. The Spaceman uh, was throwing really good. And uh, it was 78, I believe. And... Uh, but was that to protest air pollution or...? No, that was just they wanted uh, me in a Spaceman suit, an authentic uh, right. Buzz Aldrin, made in Hartford, Connecticut suit. And they wanted me on the mound. And it was in, of all places, on the road. They flew it into Milwaukee. Ooh. And I wore it in Milwaukee. I hit it. I hit a home run in that outfit too. <laughs> I said, if I'm going to make me pitch and everything else, you got to throw me a few balls. I'm going to see if I can hit in this outfit. <laughs> and I wrapped one around the right field pole. How is it running around the bases in that? I didn't run. You didn't I run. didn't run. I just uh, they couldn't get it. If you notice in the picture, the boots, uh, the zippers down. My fly is all the way open in that outfit because it, I couldn't get it on because astronauts weren't as big as me. They were all little short guys. Okay. Earlier you had mentioned you were pro-environment before Al Gore. Oh yeah. 1969. Limits to Growth by the Meadows out of MIT. Probably one of the great fundamental pegs in my, uh, you know, my bookstore along with Buckminster Fuller's Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth, which was written in 69. 69 was an amazing year. It's the year I came up to the big leagues. It was Woodstock. It was, uh, you know, the protest in Vietnam. There was a very big 
counterculture thing then, and we were going to take over the planet and make it a more peaceful place. Well, we got stoned and we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, you're also a farmer. Are there any telltale signs that the environment is... Uh... Oh, yes. Ferns. Ferns are encroaching in all the hardwood forests of the Northeast because of acid rain. Ferns are, as they, they, they take the seedlings and it doesn't allow the young maple tree to grow. And as Suzuki, the great Canadian, said, the maple tree may be extinct by the end of the century. You know, which is very sad because what are we going to put on our pancakes? <laughs> well, there's a quote, but... Yeah. Okay, and then this will bring me to the topic, grass versus astroturf. With a lot of ballparks being natural grass, is that a waste of resources? No, because uh, astroturf is made out of a synthetic, out of, out of uh, polyurethane, which is made out of petroleum. Mm -hmm. So you're basically using a non-renewable product to make something that grass grows all the time and grows every day because of photosynthesis and uh, all ballparks. You should, the uh, Kinsella wrote the book called Thrill of the Grass, a little short story, and that was the most amazing story about 1981 in Philadelphia, which is a must read. And, uh, you know, natural is always better, as the great Tug McGraw once said, you know, what's the difference between astroturf and natural grass? He goes, Hey, I never smoked astroturf. <laughs> Be smoked grass. As a traditionalist, what are your thoughts of Comiskey Park and Soon Tiger Stadium being destroyed? Oh, the old brick stadium yeah. that I tear it down. Uh, it's inevitable that certain things fall into decay, and if you don't keep them up, uh, they become a trap and stuff. And Comerica Park is was the wrong way to go. They should have kept bricks. They should have fixed it up. I believe in the small quaint stadiums where Ernie Harwell did some of his best broadcasting and uh, it's a shame and, and Comiskey was the new Comiskey is just as bad as the old Comiskey <laughs> you know the urinals didn't work uh, they had to build it higher because the people in the tenements were shooting into the stadium <laughs> in the south side of Chicago there are a whole lot of things that people don't know about that ballpark uh, and it's uh, they're you know Build a new ballpark. Why don't you fix the inner city? You know, make it so that uh, there's a little bit of equity between the north side of Chicago and the south side of Chicago, instead of driving all the people out to the suburbs and then making the inside of your cities look like donut holes. Right. You know. Or you can steal a team from someone else's city and use the public treasury to build a stadium. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be uh, our nation's capital. <laughs> First in war, first in peace, last in the National League East. <laughs> With these ballparks going down, is Fenway next? No. Fenway has been saved as a preserved site. I was instrumental in that with a group out of Cambridge called Save Fenway Park. And the new owner, John Henry, agreed with us, and that's why he bought the ball club. And he's put all his resources into restoring that place and making it better every year. And that's why the Red Sox will win uh, the next 20 World Series in a row. <laughs> you cursed them. You yeah, cursed them. Yeah, 18 out of 20. What the heck? All right. Not that we're counting. They're a good ball club, you know. Should there be another round added to the playoffs? Wow. No. It's long enough because it encroaches a hockey starts sooner and basketball starts sooner. You, you just got no time for tiddlywinks anymore. You got to play a 154 game schedule, 162 game schedule. I feel sorry for the Colorado Rockies. I think they were shortchanged because they were so good and Arizona was so bad that it forced them to win too soon, which acted against them. So their own success actually destroyed them. True. They peaked. Humans. Yeah, they peaked too soon. But they went 21 out of 22 and they got swept easily. Didn't yeah, it was all because of the delay. You think so? Oh yeah. You just can't. You can't sustain momentum, and and if you're not playing, right. You just can't sustain momentum if you're sitting on your ass playing with yourselves. But, <laughs> but does that make the entire National League look bad? No. It uh, just shows that they they were a gutsy team. Uh, Clint yeah. Hurdle did a great job. I mean, they all believed in themselves. They all played well, and uh, you know, you just. Uh, 
they just uh, they succumb to their own success, and it, it was it's a sad thing. But uh, you lost to the Red Sox, and they were a good ball club too. You know, I think the two best teams were in it at the end. Okay. The trouble is, one team was uh, didn't have any gas in the tank. What's the nightmare matchup for you? Yankees versus? Oh, Yankees? No, the Yankees. You know, you got to give Steinbrenner credit. He brought competition back. They were very bad when I played there, and uh, they gave us something to hate. Right. And uh, it really is a s stimulant for Red Sox Nation, which I do not agree with. I don't believe in nations of any sort. I'm right. not a flag waver. I'm a more of a universalist. And, uh, but uh, bad matchups, just bad baseball. You know, the Red Sox-Yankees are four and a half hour ball games. Kids don't get to see them. You know, we're over-specializing the sport that is basically going to be its own demise under the weight of, of commercialism. And uh, we've got to find ways to play quicker games. We've got to keep the baseball in the ball game. Just because it gets a blemish on it, leave it in the ball game. You know, rub it off. Uh, what are umpires? They used to rub up the baseballs. Now they send them out to someone else to rub up the baseballs. You know, the umpires don't do their jobs anymore. And that's a shame. You know, it's because we got rid of the American League and the National League president, which used to have a little, uh, used to be a little difference between the two of them, a little rivalry. And now it's just homogenized with that damn Bud Selig baseball that sucks. You know? <laughs> and, uh, can a DH win the MVP, in your opinion? Oh, yeah. DH can win it. Ortiz can win it. You know, anybody that carries a ball club is your most valuable player. If he's the guy who drives in all the clutch runs with two outs and wins 25 ball games in the ninth inning, he's your MVP. I don't care what job he does. Can a closer win the Cy Young? Yeah, closers win Cy Youngs. If you close Gagne, he closes 93 ball games in a row or something like that. You know, that's an amazing statistic. No one beat him. Mike Marshall was MVP one year. No one threw more games than Mike Marshall. Let's talk about this one. Oh, my God. Oh, this is just... Okay, why why would a Red Sox author put Yogi Bear on the cover? Exactly. Exactly. It was not my idea as a publishing, you know. Who would you have liked to have put? Uh, me. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Yogi's a philosopher. I think it's great. I, I love the, the way Jim and I put everything into chapters based on uh, the way we sorted it out. I think we work fast. We work good. Uh, he's a brilliant author. And uh, the two of us together did a great job on this. This is a hilarious book that a lot of a lot of people have uh, not read. <laughs> you know, and the ones that have read it uh, just uh, you know they, they they end up in a mental institution because they're laughing all the time, <laughs> not doing what they should be doing. Well, going into the project, did you have any personal eccentrics that you wanted to put in there? No, no, I wanted to be told about it. Uh, I wanted to know the history. Jim had it, and then uh, it was my take on this and why they were eccentric or why they weren't eccentric. And eccentricity is, is original thinking, you know, and I believe in that. And, uh, you know, guys like John Stone are just, uh, they're plagiarists in a lot of ways. I mean, he does a lot of good things and stuff, but he's not exactly the original eccentric. He, uh, you know, he did pranks, and he's one of more of the prankster type, which is another chapter in here. Did you ever do a prank? No, not really. I, I, I don't like to embarrass other people. I don't right. like to call attention to myself. Other people would say I do, but I don't on behalf of myself. I call attention to problems in the planet, and I call attention, and I believe I'm an original thinker that way. Or at least I can correlate all the things that I have learned and make it like uh, Al Gore, you know, original thinking. He invented baseball. Yeah, he invented <laughs> Al Gore, that's true. Al Gore is unbelievable. But, you know, Gore Vidal is from that family too. And he's an original thinker. You know, his American essays are some of the greatest collections of uh, stories that will never be read because he's gay. <laughs> so you have players and owners and everyone. George W. Bush at one time was the owner of the Texas Rangers. Yeah, go figure. Impeach George W. Bush for trading Sammy Sosa. <laughs> that is my mantra. Uh, I guess baseball people shouldn't run a country. Yeah, no, it's a good little book. Uh, I've done good. You know, I, I, I got a, 
you know, I, I've written some good stuff, and I've got uh, Jim is a Canadian, you know, and uh, he's a brilliant author, and he puts things in the perspective, and uh, you know, it's uh, that's. You I make... like to sit down. I like to write poetry. I'm going to end up writing poetry, I think. Nice. That's what I'm going to probably end up writing, and uh, I want to be an artist. You know, I want to be an impressionist uh, from the Pacific Northwest. I want to make birdhouses uh, out of driftwood. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, you mentioned Fenway Park's haunted. Fenway Park is haunted. It's, bu it's built on a landfill. It's, uh, it's basically reclaimed land, you know, and the... You know, there was a lot of clam bogs and everything else around there, and uh, you know, is Boston, the whole damn town of Boston, is just a swamp that's been reclaimed. You know, oh. and uh, if you look at the the, the market in Faneuil Hall, the water used to come all the way up and lap right up along the side there where they brought the boats in. Now it goes all the way down to the all the way down to the wharf and Long Wharf, and that's all reclaimed land. And but guess what? According to Al Gore, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> I think he invented spiritualism. <laughs> he, he invented global warming. He invented <laughs> the ice caps are melting. No, it's not. Nassau said it's just circulations of currents he, under the earth and stuff like that. He invented the split finger fastball. Yeah, he invented the fork ball. <laughs> His wife, though, broke up all those Led Zeppelin albums in <laughs> Tennessee, and boy. That's why I didn't vote for it. <laughs> <laughs> but Red so you mentioned former Red Sox owner who passed away is one of the ghosts who haunts it. How, how do you pronounce his name? Yali? Oh, Yaki. Yaki. Tom Yaki. Well, Tom Yaki is a he's a southerner. He was a, adopted. He just he's one of these kids that was an orphan kid that got into a family and inherited, you know, billions of dollars, and he owned one seventh of the coastline of. Uh, of South Carolina, and uh, he killed all these birds because he was a, a devotee of, of getting rid of the soft pine beetle any way you could, and he was a DDT freak. Ooh. And he wondered why all the birds were dying, and I said, Tom, you, you've killed them all, <laughs> and uh, you're going to have to come back and uh, as, a bird. Know, as a bird, and you're going to have to go through that, uh, those certain vendas and everything else that all... Uh, all Hindus have to come back as. And then I saw him as a pigeon one day, and I've seen him and his wife as crows lately. So, he's around. And that's cool. All right, so we're going to close it up because I'm on the last page here. The Montreal Nightlife versus the Montreal Expos. Wow. The Montreal Nightlife will eat you up. <laughs> but for 79, 80, and 81, we had the power to survive that. Why? Because the other teams partied harder than us. Because this town would eat you up. Crescent Street, four in the morning, would eat a Philadelphia Philly and spit him back on the street. It killed Keith Hernandez. It killed them all. It killed them, and we went out and we devastated. We were the best ball club, all except for those three bad pitches that Bonson threw, and Steve Rogers hung that curveball, and Rick Mundy hit that. Uh, but Steve had a great year. I mean, for a pigeon-toed guy, he's the, the <laughs> best pigeon-toed pitcher I ever saw. He was uh, your co-representative with the Expos. Yes, he was co-representative, and he didn't represent me when I got banished. Uh, you know, I was eating that egg salad sandwich at John Milner's the day that I stuck up for Rodney Scott. Uh, you never saw, you never saw Cy. <laughs> he, used, he used to call himself Cy after Cy Young, but really, when uh, the going got tough, his name was Sayonara. <laughs> <laughs> and you pitched against him this past June. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I love pitching against Steve. He's still hard to hit. He's a sinker ball pitcher, but if he throws me that sinker, I'm going to hit it right up the middle, right between his forehead, and he will have an upside-down cross, just like George W. Bush. <laughs> you, go happy, you go happy hunting ground. Nice. So in Baseball Mogul 2008, you get to assume the role of the general manager of the franchise. Wow. If you could be a GM of from 1901 to 2007, which team and what would you do? Wow. 27 Yankees. Uh, there's a lot of great teams. I, I'll take the Red Sox of last year. Ooh. I'd take the Red Sox and I'd beat you. I'd beat you up in a, in a heartbeat, especially when they're firing on all, all cylinders. And we saw them. When Beckett was throwing and Schilling was throwing and Matsuzaka and, uh, and uh, you know, Papelbaum, the River Dancer as a closer, there was no team that could beat that ball club 
in a, in a seven game series that I've ever seen around. I mean, they're better than the Big Red Machine. The Big Red Machine didn't have the pitching that the uh, Red Sox had, especially when they're firing on all cylinders. There's a lot of great teams out there, you know, I mean, that played this game. The old, uh, at, during the time, the St. Louis Cardinals were as good as anyone. Uh, you know, the Gas House Gang, you had Dean, you had all these great ball players, and they were tough and they hated each other. You know, they weren't beating up on uh, the league, they were beating up on themselves. And uh, the Oakland, uh, Oakland team of 72, 73, 74, those were, I mean, Catfish Hunter, you know, all those guys on that, Raleigh Fingers in the bullpen, Blue Moon Odom, Vita Blue. They were a pretty good, formidable team, too. Good. There's a lot of great teams. And you put together great teams through great farm systems. And Branch Rickey, you know, brought up guys, the, the Dodgers and uh, Pittsburgh, and uh, you look at some of the great teams. You know, a general manager is someone that uh, knows what he's doing, you know, a good one. And he has that one moment in the sun when all things are firing on, he's got a new concept. And that guy in Oakland, you know, Billy Bean ain't one of them. But <laughs> Billy Bean's biggest flaw is that he doesn't like baseball. Oh. He doesn't watch the ball games. He gets in his car and goes home. You know, he was a phenom that didn't make it, and he just doesn't like to surround himself with phenoms. He likes to make it with uh, the Hattiebergs and the underachievers, which is a good thing, because those are your uh, your Euclidus and your Pedroyas and your guys that can hit with two strikes. Those are great ball players too. But you better have the big dogs too. You better have the Ortizes and you better have the Manny Ramirez's and the low that hits in the clutch. But he might not be there. Oh, he'll be there. He'll be there? We'll get low. He's saying no to 40 million. Is he? Over three years, he wants to test the market. Oh, don't do it. You don't need the money. See, you'll fall. You've got gray hair. You have gray hair in your beard. <laughs> and as in the great Tom Roberts, the Tom Roberts novels, you know, Still Life and Woodpecker and all the other ones, once you get a little gray in your beard, your kids are going to kill you. <laughs> all right, so on that, oh, that's cool. That's cool. That's Shakespeare all the way. Yeah, yeah. that's Shakespeare. That's Shakespeare. Once you see the gray, you're, you're that's going to That's good. Watch. Well, we'll just ask him. So any plans in the new year? Are you still going to tour? I want to go see my doctor and uh, get a shot and rehab my left knee and uh, lose another 15 pounds. And uh, I want to come back as a ballerina. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Actually, my wife said i got to dance more. I gotta dance more, I owe it to her, you know, Diana, who's put up with me all these times. And we're gonna go to BC and uh, I'm gonna retire. I wanna I wanna make bar stools. <laughs> <laughs> We're already done. All right, cool. Well, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank